Tonight is what we're calling our, uh, our family meeting. Um, and it's kind of, we have some, some leadership things that we want to update you guys on. And, um, you know, some churches might call this the annual business meeting, um, but we're not calling it that. We're calling it our family meeting, and we're excited about what we're going to talk about tonight. Some leadership things, but also um, our, our homecoming capital campaign. And some of you, if you're newer with us, you might not even know what that is what that is. And uh, so we're going to talk about that tonight and give you some updates that are really, really exciting. And uh, we're excited about that. Before we dive into all that, I do uh, want to just mention that um, Jeff and Melissa Boyce, who lead Cedar and Oak Ministries, that we announced a few weeks ago, they're having a special event coming up uh, July 7th, Friday night, next, this, this coming Friday, right? Yes, this coming Friday at, uh, Mount Orb Park, almost said Georgetown for some reason. Mount Orb Park, uh, the building, fam- building Firm Foundation's family event for kids and at-risk youth. And they're also leading that missions trip to Mexico in October. And so they're right here. If you guys could raise your hands real quick. Yes. And uh, so they will be, if, listen. I got my dad voice there. I was like, listen, calm down, simmer, simmer. (laughs) Uh, I'll let you give them some love. Um, But they will be in the back right corner after the service is over. If you're interested in, you know, joining that event, sponsoring the event, being a part of that that event, or if you're interested in the missions trip. So uh, back right corner, my right. So that one right there, okay? Some of you are like, this one? No, that one, my right. All right. So that they'll be over there, and um, also I six eight uh, Dallas, our ministry team leader. Uh, yeah, Lee's <laughs> feeling the love tonight. Feeling the love. Uh, I six eight's leading the um, Freedom Night uh, that same night, and so uh, that same night in Mount Orr Park. And so if you need pe- if you know people who need freedom, invite them to that. And there's going to be testimony shared worship. Uh, a short message. I noticed it said a short message on their web on the on the event page, and uh, whatever that means. And then uh, <laughs> I think our church has a different definition of a short message than a lot of other churches. But anyways, short message testimonies um, and ministry time. And so uh, their ministry team available to minister to people. And so mark your calendars and and uh, plan on inviting people to that. And again. Cedar and Oak Ministries, I-68 Ministries, like them on Facebook and social media, and uh, you can receive those updates as well. So this weekend is July 4th weekend, right? It's like uh, Independence uh, Day weekend for our, for our culture um, in America. And it's, it's interesting because one year ago this weekend... Uh, we celebrated our name change from Resonance Church to Free People Church. So it is officially one year that we have been free people. Isn't that awesome? So uh, if you're new at this tonight, a very short summary of our of our journey. But we started in April 2014 as Resonance Church. And we've been on this journey of transformation and growth, not only numerically, but spiritually speaking. And uh, when we started, man, we were young and dumb, maybe, Um, maybe. We were young and and not that experienced. And we just, resonance was about, we just want to resonate with the Spirit of God and do what He's doing. That that was the whole whole thing. And uh, and He's had us on this journey of growing in the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts and the things of God and, of course, knowledge of Scripture and all that and uh, and how to do what He wants to do in the earth. And uh, over the last year especially, we've been in this really a metamorphosis. In fact, uh, words, prophetic words, dreams, things like that were beginning to be given through 2020 about our church family. Like, we're entering into this cocoon, and resonance is like a caterpillar, and you're going to emerge this butterfly. And then I think it was January of 2021 that the Lord first spoke to me, uh, the name of your church is Free People. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, no, it's not. And then we started this journey of talking about that. It took over a year um, with our staff and leaders. And, and first of all, discerning that, is this the Lord? And, and then once that's confirmed, the proce- starting the process of the work involved to change our name. And then we, that culminated last summer. Um, and so we've been on this journey, and, and a, a, 
little over a year ago, uh, a lot of our people, staff, leadership, uh, ministry team got filled with the Holy Spirit in a pretty new, radical way, uh, which has been amazing. Um, the prophetic word God gave is like, you're getting a double portion, and boy, did we. And so, um, and then that started a process where we've just been going after the Lord, the fullness of God, and um, and a whole bunch of people have had that same experience over the last year. It's been a really a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, people who've never experienced spiritual gifts or Holy Spirit or, you know, praying in tongues, receiving their prayer language, all that. Dozens and dozens of people have been experiencing that in our, in our church family um, over the past year. It's just incredible. It's been amazing. And so the Holy Spirit's really been moving and, and, and free people. We didn't fully realize it when the Lord gave us that name, but that's really the name for the fullness of God's vision over our church and, and what he wants us to be. And one way we like to say that is we want to be uh, in our culture, unconditional in love, uncompromising in truth, and undoubtedly full of the Holy Spirit. Because I think that's what you see in the early church in the book of Acts. That is the culture of the church that God wants. Unconditional in love, absolutely. But especially in our culture today, uncompromising on the truth of God in every single area of life. Because the truth is what sets us free and brings freedom. And then, of course, being full of the Holy Spirit, uh, which especially the church in America whew, really needs really needs more than ever uh, in our culture. And so that's what we're about. You know, we want to we want to help people do four things as a church family. Love God, live free, build family and bring the kingdom. And again, we believe that's what you see in Scripture. This is what God's leading us to do. Uh, so that's a little bit about us and about Free People Church. Um, when we started as residents, um, you know, my wife and I moved here to start a church, and that was it, right? And we invited these. We knew some. We were from this area originally. We spent time in college in Indiana. Then we spent uh, five years in Detroit, Michigan, as I was a, a worship pastor up there. That's where the Lord called us to start a church. We were there for five years. Then we moved here to start this church. And we knew some people in the area, and we felt very led to invite some of those people to, to help us uh, start this church. And uh, initially, it was three other families. And so as the story goes, we started with, with eight adults in a living room, and that's how we started meeting. And uh, God's just done so much. It's been a really beautiful journey. And um, those, those eight people, and then we threw a few more people in there, a few more families in there as we went along, uh, became kind of like a leadership team over this church, and we called it the core team. And early on, even the first covenant I had that team sign, it said something like, this is not an eldership, right? Like, Aaron is kind of the sole elder of this church starting out, because uh, that's just kind of how it has to be when you start a church, right? And then as we grow, uh, eventually, we will install elders and do all this. And, and, but this team is, is going to provide wisdom. It's going to provide accountability. And it's, it's going to help me make decisions so I'm not alone in this. And, of course, uh, serve and, and lead by example and all those things. And those people did that. And that's kind of been that team since we started. And I'm summarizing a whole lot here. But uh, basically, I'll say last year sometime, I think it was summer, maybe fall, started really, I think it was the fall, started feeling very impressed by the Lord that uh, he wanted us to move to a biblical eldership in our in our leadership all right and so of course we began studying that and what what is that what does that mean what does that look like and and oh, I'm trying not to describe the whole process because it'll I, I'll, I'll talk for an hour about it but uh, shared that with the team we talked about that we kind of I shared the, like a bible study with them like that that core leadership team and uh, they agreed with that. They're like, yes, we should do this, and, and it's time to do this. One of my church planning coaches said when we were starting out, do not install elders for at least the first five years. And I was like, okay, why not? And he's like, well, you're starting a church. Most people you reach aren't even going to know Jesus. Then they get saved, and then you know, it's going to take time for people to mature, and so just don't rush that process. And it's like, okay, cool. And so we are in our, let's see, we celebrated our ninth birthday as a church um, back in April that, since we started. And so, again, just we've been maturing as a church and just the Lord felt like the Lord was saying it's time. So we did this Bible study. This is what an eldership is. And 
this team, that, that core leadership team, um, I was like, okay, let's create a process. We need to create a process for selecting elders. And then I want this team to go, if you feel led to, to go through that process, I want this team to go through that process um, and helping choose or nominate the, the potential elders. And then I want this team, so this team's going to help set up the process, then this team's going to nominate, then this team's going to lead those candidates through the process, then this team's going to install those elders. And once we do that, then this team will be done and the eldership will be our our new leadership team, so uh, so to speak. And so we went through that process starting last fall up through uh, this spring, and we finished the um, what you might call the process of selecting elders. And then uh, we, we talked about people that we were feeling like could be potential elders, um, and I am one of them, uh, by the way. Uh, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a shoe in. What do they call it? I'm a grandfathered in. Uh, so I'm an elder already. I, I was from the beginning. If, I'm, if the guy starting the church is not an elder or an overseer, something's wrong. Okay? That's, okay. can get into that later. But um, so I am one of them. But then who, who else, right? And so we, uh, there's several people in our church that we felt the Lord was highlighting, but two in particular stood out. And uh, we led them through this process. And I'm going to explain a little bit. And, and let me just tell you what we're about to do. Um, I want to explain the qualifications. The uh, two men were highlighted, two men. And, and what we're doing is we're installing two elders tonight, along with myself, who will be our eldership leadership team. Um, and in addition to that, um, I want to bring up here in a minute uh, that original core team. Um, and I just want to honor those people who are part of that who will not be on the eldership moving forward. And so that team's going to kind of be done. Um, and I want to honor them and talk about that a little bit. And then we're going to pray over our new, our new eldership tonight. So um, for someone to be chosen for eldership, they have to meet for, there's four areas that they would be assessed for, Okay. And this is how I'm uh, summarizing a whole lot of Bible, okay, in four words that start with a C because that's what preachers do. We make things start with the same letter because we think it helps you remember, but it probably doesn't. But anyways, um, so character, competency, culture, and then chosen is how I'm describing the last one there. Character, competency, culture, and chosen. So character, this is 1 Timothy 3, I think, and Titus 1. I believe those are the chapters um, that have the qualifications of an elder. And it talks about husband of one wife, so not sexually immoral, uh, temperate, self-controlled, gentle, not quarrelsome, not given to drunkenness, good reputation with outsiders, manages their own family well, um, so on and so forth. A servant heart, humble, teachable, um, leading by example, all these types of things. That's the character, a mature character of integrity. Secondly, the competency, this is experience and giftings. So scripture says not a recent convert or they could be conceited. Like, oh, I just got saved and I'm already the leader, you know, and I'm one of the leaders, right? So, it, you know, how do you quantify not a recent convert? It, scripture doesn't say, but in our context, and these are guidelines, we're like, you should probably um, have been saved for at least five years, right? I don't know. Um, and again, these are guidelines. And then have served in our church for in a significant way for at least two years to, to be, you know, a potential uh, eldership candidate. Um, and then competency as well has to do with spiritual giftings. And honestly, I've never heard anyone put it this way, but when I studied the scriptures, there's a lot of scripture I'm not going to read because I don't want to spend our whole time talking about this, but... Um, Scripture highlights what I would call three spiritual gifts that every elder, if you're going to be an elder, you need to have all three of these spiritual gifts. And it's pastoring, teaching, and leadership, or also known as administration. Um, why do I say that? There are scriptures that say elders are to pastor or shepherd the flock of God. If someone's going to pastor or shepherd the flock, they need to have a pastoring gift or else they're going to be, they're, it's, they're going to be terrible at shepherding, right? Um, and so... Uh, it says they must be able to teach. Again, a teaching gift. And then uh, leadership. They must manage the affairs of the church well. The affairs of the church being everything. 
So not just spiritual leadership, not just pastoring and shepherd. Pastoring has more to do with like, you know, pastoral counseling. You know, if you have questions about spirituality, your marriage, how to live your life, those types of things. But leaders in the church, overseers, which is, by the way, a term used synonymously with elder in scripture, overseer, manager, um, the leaders, right? Um, they also have to make decisions about money. And they have to make decisions about when are we going to do service times. And they have to make decisions about all these very practical managerial types of things. Um, and so that's where that leadership administration gift comes in. And so I, I wrote it that way. Like, we need to look for people that have these three gifts. And if they only have two of those gifts um, that we're seeing in them, then they're probably a great leader, but they're not quite ready to be an elder, right? Um, and also, I do want to say, these three giftings... They don't have to be, they're, they're probably going to be stronger in one or two than, than the other, right? And so they don't have to be like, when, it, when we talk about teaching, something our team talked about is they don't have to be a preacher standing on the stage teaching the Bible line by line, right? But this happens a lot. It, say someone's upset about something in the church and they're thinking about leaving or, or I, you know, say something in the service about speaking in tongues and it's like, oh, that brings up a question. Every elder that's an elder needs to be able to sit with anybody in our church and be able to explain why we believe what we believe. Not only the basics of the faith, but the specifics of our church culture and walk them through that. And that is both pastoring, but that's also teaching. There, there's teaching uh, in there. And so, anyways, th that's the example of the competencies involved. Also, the, the culture. And what we mean by that is our specific culture. And so, if you're here and you have meet all these other requirements uh, or have qualifications, but, like, you don't really believe the Holy Spirit gifts are for today and you're not, you just don't like the Holy Spirit very much, probably not meant to be an elder in this church, okay? Um, and so we have a very specific culture that we feel called to. And, uh, of course, we want uh, people to believe in that culture and, and, and facilitate that culture uh, on an ongoing basis. And then the last one, they're being chosen. And, and ch what I mean by that, elders in particular are chosen or appointed, okay? Chosen by us, people we feel good about, uh, but also chosen by the Lord. And, and then obviously, uh, when they're chosen, they have the desire in them. The, they choose themselves, all right? If, if they're like, you know, I really hate this, but I guess I'll do it. Okay, then we don't choose you anymore, all right? <laughs> like, they need a desire as well. Um. So Acts chapter 1, 23 and 22 says, uh, so they nominate, this is when they're replacing Judas after resurrection, before, after the ascension, before Pentecost. Um, and, and Peter's like, hey guys, guess what? There's only 11 of us now, uh, so we need to replace Judas, right? And this is, the Lord is leading them to prepare for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, whew, mm, we're in a similar season right now. And I might get into that a little later, but um, yeah, so <laughs> I won't get into it right now. But they chose two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Verse 24 says, then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen. And so they're saying, we see these two men as leaders, but Lord, we only, we only have one spot. Which, which one are you choosing? All right. Then they rolled dice. That's just interesting. Anyways, we're not doing that. But um, they really did. It was like casting lots. Anyways, Acts chapter 13, verse 2, it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the, for the work to which I've called them. The Holy Spirit is picking people <laughs> to do things. All right? And uh, we like to say around here, Jesus is the lead pastor of this church. And we take that very seriously. My new title is lead servant and overseer. I'm an overseer of this church, which means I'm a manager for Jesus. And we seek the Lord in prayer, and we go, Jesus, what do you want in this church? Okay, now we're going to do it. Okay, and we discern that together, by the way. Um, and so uh, seeking Jesus, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit is, there's freedom. <sighs> where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, right? The Lord is the Spirit. Jesus isn't with us in the flesh anymore. He's with us by the Spirit. So we seek the Holy Spirit through prayer. That's seeking Jesus' leadership. So we talk a lot about the prophetic record in our church. That's a phrase I like to use. So when we make decisions, what is the Lord saying? 
right? What do we mean by prophetic record? Okay, if scripture speaks on it, then that's, it's scripture, it's in black and white. But all the decisions we have to make about service times and all this that scripture doesn't speak to and, and how to manage the money and, and where we're going to put money and do all the budgets and all this stuff. What's the Lord saying? You know, what prophetic record, right? Dreams, visions, words from the Lord. You know, what's the Lord been speaking to you? Here's what he's speaking to me. And what's cool is when you find People having different words, different experiences, different dreams and visions that are all saying the same thing. It's like, this is what the Lord is saying, this confirmation, right? And so anyways, the Holy Spirit's picking people. So he's cho- God's choosing, right? But they're choosing as well. So they're kind of nominating God's confirming. Yes, this is my choice. And then Titus 1 verse 5 uh, says, Paul says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. He's writing to Titus. So Paul's an apostle. Titus, and he writes something similar to Timothy. Titus and Timothy were basically taking Paul's place as an apostolic overseer. And when they would go to the different towns, they would appoint elders. So You know, in Acts chapter 6, they would say, hey, church, choose seven men among you to serve in this specific role. That's actually deacon, servant leadership, like specific ministries. It's not eldership. Eldership is not, hey, here's some people y'all pick for yourselves. And, And it's not a democracy. It's not the church voting in scripture. It is an apostolic overseer appointing, right? Hopefully with the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the confirmation of other leaders, right? And so that's what Paul was getting at in Titus. So elders are chosen by leadership, by God, confirming this is who I want, and then they're appointed, right? And so we don't vote at our church because we don't see that in Scripture. To put it this way, it's not a popularity contest. It's a calling. And what we are doing as leaders, me, myself and the, and the other uh, leadership team that is installing these elders, uh, we are, we're listening for the Lord. We're looking for what God's doing. Then we're confirming it, and then we're appointing. And we're saying we're confirming what God is doing and that he is uh, appointing you to this. Um, and so with all that in mind, um, we're going to do all this together. So um, I want to kind of announce who our elders are. And again, it's myself, and then we have two, two other men. Uh, One of them is Kenton Bailey, and uh, where's Kenton at? Is he back there? Okay, so can you go ahead and come on up? Kenton is also our sound man, main sound man. We have other sound men as well, but. And then uh, Dallas Barber, if you could go ahead and come on up. Yeah, show them some love. And I'm going to make a little more room here. Come on up, come on up, come on up. And we're going to pray over these men here in a minute and install them. Um, so like I said, uh, well, at this point, I just want to bring up our, our leadership team. Uh, our core team, um, we changed the name to lead team after a while, so we use those terms interchangeably. But if you're on that, Jamie and Rihanna, go ahead and come on up. Uh, Erica, and then Tasha, if you want to go ahead and come on up. And Clinton Lindsay, yep. My wife's holding a four-year-old child so, who's asleep, I think. So she might not be coming up. Awesome. Where's We got Lindsay. Is Clint somewhere? Oh, there he is. Hey. Hey. It's like, it's like the price is right. Awesome. So. Um, so. Clinton, Lindsay, and Tosh and Kenton uh, were two of those original families, the three that my wife and I invited. There was one other family that doesn't go to our church anymore that was part of that as well. So they've been on this team since the beginning, since the living room days. In fact, the very first meeting we ever had was in Clinton, Lindsay's living room at a house in Lake Winoco, way, 08. That was in 08. That was way back. Then we waited like four years before we started the church. But anyways... Um, and then we met in Tosh and Ken's house in Lake Winoka for a while, so that was really special. Um, and then after we started the church, uh, well, even when we were meeting in the houses, 
uh, Jamie and Rihanna joined us. Very, they were like the fourth or fifth family that joined us very, very early on. And, uh, and then after a few years, uh, the Lord was highlighting them to us, and they joined this team. And, of course, Jamie is our youth pastor, in case you're unaware, uh, and is still our youth pastor. And in it, so, so these three families, in addition to, um, you know, serving on this team for, I think, about seven years in your case and nine years in your case, maybe ten if you count the pre-launch year. Anyways, uh, in addition to that, they've also been serving in kids ministry and worship and youth and pretty much every way you can serve in our church on an ongoing basis in different ways. Uh, sound, Kenton's been our main sound guy since the beginning. Um, so on and so on and so on. Um, Dallas and Lynn came very early on as well and became a part of our church in, within a year or two of us starting. Um, and so they've been a part of our church family for a very long time. Um, and again, they lead I-68 Ministries. They've, they've been doing so much. They've served in our church in a whole lot of ways and also um, leading I-68 Ministries and helping uh, drug addicts and their families. And, and they're just amazing people of God. Um, and I want to ask Lynn to come on up. Sorry, I uh, didn't clarify that. Um, so you guys can show her some love, maybe. All right. Awesome. And so first I want to just give honor and show honor to these two families. That So, so Kenton has been on this team, and he's going to continue on being an elder. And... Um, he has a beard worthy of eldership, don't you think? I mean, I didn't, that was actually one of the, we have to have someone that has a long beard. I'm just kidding. It's biblical. It's just biblical. Anyways, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and then Dallas, of course, is the other one. And, oh, okay, yeah. Well, so it's like nothing, middle, and then the ultimate. So that's amazing. We have all peoples represented in our facial hair. Wow. <laughs> it's such diversity. It is. It really is. Amazing. Um, and so, like I said, this, this core team established this process, led these men through this process, affirmed, we kind of interviewed them, and, and then we talked about them uh, behind their backs. Um, and it just felt like the Lord was obviously confirming that. That's why we're here tonight doing this. And, uh, and so tonight we're making this official and installing them as elders. But I do want to give uh, the Warrens, a gift from our church and uh, the berries as well. And this is by no means could ever compensate or make up for all the time served, all the meetings, all the prayers. Um, it's just a token of our appreciation. And we love you guys, just to bless you guys as we're making this transition. And, uh, You know, when you serve in the trenches with people and you go through things, <laughs> they become your best friends, you know? And um, Jesus said after three years of serving alongside his disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And uh, the, the people on this stage are some of my best friends in this life. And... Um, those friendships are forged through a whole lot of good times, good memories, and a whole lot of hard times, and uh, uh, praying each other through and seeing each other through, and uh, they've been some of my biggest supporters, and they helped, especially these two families. I just want to honor them and, and you all as well, but they helped start this church. They helped establish this church. Um, and then as the Lord was leading us to transition and, and change our name, but it's not just a name change, like the, the new wineskin, so to speak, of free people, they helped transition us into that. And uh, I've told them each this personally, but, you know, 2021 was a year for me where it was extremely difficult in ministry. And I've told them each this, but I just want you guys to know this, that if I didn't have their support, I don't know if I would still be standing here through that year. And that's the level that we're talking about. Um, and so the Bible says, give to people what you owe them. And when you owe them honor, you give it to them. And so I give these people honor tonight. And I say to each one of you, thank you for serving on this team. 
Thank you for doing what you've done. Thank you for all those meetings and long nights. And these people have small children. And, uh, man, I'm telling you, some of our meetings, like, we will be done by 8.30. 10, 11 p.m. comes up. It's like the kids are going berserk so many times. And uh, I just, words can't express my gratitude. And <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. You know, for his gum, that's all I can say. I mean, that's all I can say. So I love you guys. Thank you. We honor you. And if Resonance Church or Free People Church, if you love it, if it's changed your life, touched your life, you see me, a lot of you tell me thank you because I am the face. You see me a lot. But these are the people behind the scenes. And man, I'm telling you, year one, the people serving in kids' ministry and worship team and, and greeting at the door and passing out flyers, I mean, doing it all. And, uh, and so we owe them honor, and I want you guys to honor them tonight. So could you just show them some love, the, the core team? Yes, God, thank you. And uh, I'm going to have this, y'all stay up here, and we're going to pray over uh, Dallas and Kenton here in a minute. So you guys can have a seat. So maybe Dallas and Kenton, if you want to come out in the middle here. Um. As we were highlighting, as the Lord was highlighting people and we were talking about elders and whatnot, the Lord can add to this team, you know. I think our bylaws say at least three, no more than 12, which is good, good numbers. Um, but we felt like the Lord was saying start small, and it's these two right now. And so as time goes on, this team could grow for sure. Um, but uh, this is it right now. So uh, we're going to just pray over them. And... Uh, Felt like, I want to explain this, felt like the Lord was saying, um, these men are the elders of this church, but the men are, we're going to, we value our wives' leadership and wisdom, and so uh, all the meetings that they're able to make, we invite them into those meetings, um, and the, the, the wives honoring the men as elders is uh, their way of honoring the male headship in the home. But the men saying, no, we want you on the team <laughs> is our way of honoring them and their wisdom as our, as our partners in life. And so, and it felt like the Lord was highlighting that and saying that uh, that's the way to do it. And, and he said, for those two reasons, and then he also said, and because I want this based on family. Um, and so um, Tasha and Lynn, if you would come maybe stand, stand by your man. I, <laughs> it's an old song, man. Everyone under 30 is like, why did the older people laugh? <laughs> but anyways, um, and so Tasha and Lynn are not official elders, but they are elders' wives, and they are pastors in this church. Same thing with my wife. She's not an elder of our church, but she is my wife, and she is a pastor of Free People Church. And so I want you all to honor them um, uh, as that and as leaders in our church, if that makes sense. Um, and so... I'm going to ask you guys to just, I'll come in the middle and circle around them as best I can and maybe put a hand on them if I can. And then uh, circle around and we're just going to pray. God, I just thank you so much for the, for the honor of praying for these families and these men. I just thank you so much, Father, for this church and what you're doing here and what you started um, however many years ago it's been, Lord. But it, was, it was so small. Uh, I just remember some of those early meetings, um, so the, it was early phone conversations with Aaron. Um, I just am so thankful and grateful for what this church has meant to my family and to countless other families and people that have that have been here and um, have come through those doors at some point. And just the way you're impacting lives through what 
uh, through what you started. And frankly, Lord, just Aaron and Erica's obedience. Um, so I just want to say how thankful I, I am for that, Lord, and just for this this entire team. And uh, as we transition, Lord, as a church to this new leadership model, um, God, I just pray blessings on these families. I pray blessings on these men. I pray that you would guard and protect their minds. Um, I pray that you would give them wisdom, give them knowledge. Um, I pr pray that you would bring people into their everyday lives and their workplaces and their family that would help um, build them up and support them. Um, I pray for uh, rest in their homes, Lord, that when they're, you know, when they're not working either, either in the church at their workplace, Lord, that you would just bring them moments of refreshing and restoring their minds so they can um, be present when they need to be and lead well. And God, I just, I'm so thankful for uh, just these men, these families, and just getting to know them over the years and um, just, just becoming family with them. And I'm so excited for what you're going to do in this church, Lord. I just, I pray for Dallas and Lynn, Aaron and Erica, um, Kenton and Tasha, in no particular order. That's just the way they're standing in front of me. Uh, I just, God, I just pray that you would rain down your new blessings, new favor, new revelation for your church and your people, Lord. And we're just so, so thankful. I just pray all these blessings in your mighty, mighty name. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, so much for this moment. And God, I just, um, <laughs> it's hard to feel like you're letting go of a child in a lot of ways. But um, I know it's in great hands. And so, Lord, I just thank you, God, for Kenton and for Dallas, Lord, and, and God, their um, ability, God, you've put it inside them to lead and to do this, Lord. You had it in mind before the foundations of the world that you knew this moment would come. And so, Lord, I just pray an increase in discernment, an increase in wisdom and knowledge, Lord. And, God, I just pray that, Lord, that as, as Clint play, prayed that you would give them great rest, Lord. But also, God, I, I just pray that, God, that, um, Lord, that they won't be scared of the hard things, but they'll go after you and all that they have, Lord. And God, I just pray that, Lord, as they go forward, Lord, that, God, you would prepare them, that, God, that you would um, give them each um, endurance, Lord, endurance to do this calling, Lord, endurance to um, lead the way in this, Father. Um, and God, I just know that, Lord, that um, I thank you, God, that... Um, for these two men, God, that we trust very much. And um, I feel like you highlighted it to me, you highlighted it to several of us, Lord, uh, before we even said anything, that you highlighted these two men. So, Lord, I thank you for that. Thank you for that discernment. God, I just praise you for the time that I've had on this team. Um, thank you for that honor, Lord. Um, I don't take it lightly, Lord, but I thank you for it, God. And, Lord, I just pray that God is... As they go out of this place and they step into this new role, Lord, that, God, you would just help them to, um, to just formulate plans and, and anything that, that's going forward, Lord, that they need um, help on or discernment on, God. I just pray that, God, that they all hear your voice clearly. I pray that you would bring great unity like they've never seen before among each other and uh, unite them, make them one. Um, because, Lord, it just seems like every time that you made someone one in Scripture, God, that the Holy Spirit showed up. So, Lord, I just pray that, God, you make them one, that you make them one, that you unite them in, in their mind and their thoughts, Lord, and just all that you're doing, Lord. I just pray blessings over them, God. I just bless their families, Lord, bless their time, Lord. I just pray that their times would be um, not like, well, what are we supposed to do, but like it would be quick and efficient, Lord, to where it's like we know what we're doing and, and we know what to do, Lord. So I, I, I bless each one here, Lord. I bless, I bless Kenton. I bless Dallas, Lord. I, I bless um, Aaron and Erica. I, I bless um, Lynn and, and Dallas, Lord. I bless Tasha, God. I just bless them all, Lord. And uh, I just thank you, God, that you are... Um, I just thank you for the ones that you have in mind, Lord, and that, that they're in charge, Lord. And I just... Um, 
I release them now in Jesus' name to do what you've called them to do, Lord. And um, I just thank you, God, for the time, for the time on this team, Lord. I just thank you, Lord. And God, just bless it from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen. God, my prayer's short and sweet, (laughs) but I just pray unity over the three of us. And... um, that you would guard us from the enemy's attacks. And I pray, God, I thank you for greater wisdom and discernment. And I pray that we would always seek you first and your kingdom first. And that we would always check pride at the door of every meeting and every church meet, At the door of our homes. And that we would seek your glory on the earth first, God in every decision we make and that we would that the prayer of our hearts and the the lens through which we look when we look at decisions or people or what to do would be the lens of your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so help us die to self (laughs) help us to lead by example as 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Help us to be those kind of men, those kind of leaders. Strengthen our wives, our families for this task. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You guys can show them love as they go back to their seats. Yes, everyone has to hug everyone. (laughs) Yes, we're that kind of church. Everyone has to hug everyone. Oh. Whew. Amen. Well, it's official now. No turning back. Burn the plows, guys. All right. So the rest of our time together tonight, uh, I want to update you on our, our building project, our, home cap, our homecoming capital campaign. And if you're new with us and you don't know what that means, you're about to find out. So um, in 2021, uh, we, the owner of this building asked us if we were interested in buying it. We'd been renting this building since 2015. Um, and we thought about that. We explored those options, decided that was not a good option. We prayed about it. Uh, that would have been the simple, easier option and cheaper. Um, <laughs> but when we prayed about it, uh, felt like the Lord was highlighting. Uh, he felt like the Lord gave us two words he was highlighting. One was church in a park, or church in a, meaning church in a park-like setting uh, f- that would bless the community. And then also the word home. We want a church home that can be a home for people in this area, a home to connect with their Heavenly Father. And so as we started dreaming into that, what does that mean? What does that look like? And a church in a park-like setting, we talked about, well, that's probably not just then maybe a few acres. We're talking like more acreage probably to have uh, that park-like setting. And we just dreamed into what that could look like. And so we, we started a capital campaign a little over a year ago. It was February of last year, 2022. And uh, what we talked about is we want to find some acreage, find some land, probably about 50 acres in this area, right around Mount Orb. And this is what we would hope to create with that. And so this is our homecoming capital campaign, which, by the way, we we hope uh, to build a church home where thousands of prodigal sons and daughters in a five-county area can experience a homecoming with their Heavenly Father. Five county being Brown, Adams, Claremont, uh, Highland, and Clinton, maybe? Yes. Um, Or Claremont, sorry. But Clinton, too, all right? We actually have people coming to our church from a few other counties as well. Um, but that basically saying within and roughly a 45-minute driving radius of where we're at. Um, and so we talked about on this acreage we would hope to have 
uh, like a fishing pond. I think we have some pictures here. This is what we, these are like, this is not the actual land. This is just kind of what we were dreaming we talked about. Uh, walking and running paths throughout the land. People can, can sh- just enjoy through the week with their families or whatever. Um, environmental playground with, with splash pads. This is the dream. This is the dream, right? Um, fire pit areas, uh, nicely landscaped where, where families and groups from our church can meet uh, and use throughout the week. Um, this is a, a, a this is a definitely part of the dream one day, um, but like a wedding barn venue that we can use for weddings, um, offer to our church at reduced rates and the community as well, uh, but also that can help fund ministry. Um, and then we kind of visualize too one day having these other little buildings like that could be shops. Uh, like ice cream shop, coffee shop, those types of things, uh, but also could be like like uh, uh, art studios, worship art studios, where we could have worship arts classes and and practices and rehearsals going on through through the week and those types of things. So that's kind of the dream, right? And shortly after you know praying into this, probably at the end of 2021, uh, we found some land that was for sale, 48 acres just north of. 32 on 68 and Donnelly Road. So literally just north of where the Mexican restaurant is, if you know where that is in town. I think we have a picture. Yeah, here it is. And so there's Donnelly Road. There's the land. And then we, summarizing a whole lot through discernment process, we're like, this is the land. And we bought the land. Okay, so we own the land, all right? The closing date, by the way, for the land, which we did not pick. It was just like, here's your closing date, was April 6th of 2022. And April 6th was the birthday of when our church started. We launched on April 6th of 2014. So that was just the Lord winking at us going, yep, yep, I'm in this, I'm in this. It was just, a, it was another confirmation of, of many, many confirmations. And so we actually own this land right now. As you can see, it's kind of highlighted there. There's a, a river runs through it, all right? A river runs through it to what my kids would call a boring movie. Um, but... There is a little, it's not quite a river, it's a little creek. Um, and then there is actually a pond already on there. Definitely needs rehabbed and, and made a lot bigger. And you can see there's a lot of woods, and then there's a lot of fields in open spaces. Um, and so it's, that is the land we purchased. Um, we started the capital campaign, and we had people do pledges. And people pledged, uh, families in our church over a three-year period pledged $1.485 million uh, last February, which is awesome. And uh, the initial offering that we took up, our first fruits offering, was $156,844, which is amazing. Um, if you were part of that, thank you so much. And then year to date, uh, we have brought in so far $358,438. There we go. And some change. So that's, that's awesome. So thank you so much. Um, that's like about 24% of the total that was pledged, so far given. So thank you for that. Um, And again, it's like a three-year capital campaign. Um, We started all that, just having the land in mind and like knowing, hey, we're gonna need money. Here's what we wanna do. We know it's gonna cost a lot and we need to raise as much as we can. So that was kind of the the mindset behind it. And we started started that process. Um, Somewhere along the line of, we decided to get some architectural plans drawn up. And so we interviewed like five different uh, architects, architectural firms, um, and we have a building team, John Chamlin and uh, Dallas Barber and myself are kind of our uh, little building team. They have a lot of construction experience um, and I have very little. Um, So they're really the building team, Um, but uh, we interviewed these these architects. We narrowed it down to two. We picked one. It's Champlin, uh, Champlin, Champlin. I always pronounce it wrong. In Cincinnati, and we had them draw up some architectural plans. And I want to share those with you tonight. And so, they created these plans. We finished that process, by the way, uh, in February of this year. So um, I think the screenshots have uh, February fourteenth as the date. Valentine's Day is meant to be. Uh, and we are in love with these renderings. And so this is what the architects came up with. And when they showed it to us, we were like, I, I think I actually cried. I teared up. Um, and I was like, 
oh, this is it. Oh, my gosh. You know, it was like, this is this is it, you know. And, of course, they did a lot of meetings asking about our church identity and who are you and what do you hope for, what do you dream for, and all that. Church in a park-like setting, you know, church home, all this stuff. And so we want to show you these renderings. This is what we're dreaming for. Um, and I do want to say that our initial plan is, like, in the next few years as the Lord leads, to go after building this building on the land. Um, and then all that other stuff we mentioned, like the, the, the pond and the playscapes and all the other stuff uh, over the next, say, 10 years or so, eventually developing all those things, especially the wedding barn venue and the other shops. It's like this is a long-term vision, all right? And we start with buying the land, which we've already done, and then building the church building on it. Um, and so I think that's all I want to say. I just want to show this to you. Um, and then I want to talk about uh, kind of where we're at as a church and ask you to, to join us in this, especially those of you who have no idea. This is like the first time you're even hearing about this because I'll be honest with you. We started this capital campaign in February. And we're like, yay, we're raising money. And in March, the Holy Spirit started going berserk. And our, we have not focused on this at all. I mean, we've been keeping the meetings going and, and getting an architect and all that. But like, we're more focused on like, what is Holy Spirit doing and, and following that? Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so especially if you're new in our church as of last March or so, you're like, you, you may be like, what is, what is this, <laughs> you know, because we hardly ever talk about it. Um, and we just wanted to wait to talk about it. Uh, there was really nothing to update you on until we had the plans done. Um, and then tonight seemed like a really good weekend, our one-year anniversary, talking about eldership. Let's talk about this. Let's update people. And so if you're unaware of this or if you haven't joined in pledging or, or giving to this campaign, uh, we're, we're inviting you into that if you believe in our church, if this is your church home. And so, um, yeah, I want to show you kind of the concepts of this is our dream of, of the church building that we're hoping to build one day on this land. So first slide, I think, is just the overall site. And this is where what you might call the master plan. Um, and the architects kind of planned for everything that we had in that original vision. And so that red circle, it says future village. That's like that extra stuff that we talked about, the wedding barn venue and just all the other shops and everything. Um, oh, sorry, the wedding barn they were saying might go over here. But anyways, uh, the best place for the church building itself uh, seemed to be this place. And if you've walked this land, all of us have in leadership and staff. And we're like, yeah, that really seems like the best place. And, of course, the parking lot and uh, all the dotted lines are walking, running trails. And they kind of have planned for everything that we envision. But, of course, we would start with this and, and go to the church. Uh, Donley Road is the north border, and it dead ends at the end of our land. Uh, so if you ever want to drive back there and check out Donley Road, and, and just see the borders of the land, uh, you can check that out. Um, this is a potential road we would like to put in. It's not there right now. That just would go through the whole thing, which would be cool if it was a park-like setting and whatnot. Uh, but if need be, we could use Donley uh, and whatnot and have, it would be awesome to have a couple different entrances and exits. So that's kind of the over, overhead thing. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, this is more a close-up of kind of the layout of the building and the parking lot there. Um, won't explain that too much. The Expanding the pond, making it like a lake-ish type thing. A big pond is what I would call it in these parts. Uh, and then uh, next slide. This is the actual layout, which I want to talk about a little bit. So this is the building. And so this is, you'll see how pretty this is here in a minute. Uh, but functionally, uh, we would plan on a worship space of about 11,000 square feet. Now, this whole room is about 6,000. We rent all the space in this building we rent is 12,000. So this is almost double this size of this whole room stage included. We, if we needed to, we could cram 400 chairs in this room. We have about 360 in here right now. That gives you some context. So comfortably with a lot of space, this would hold 500 chairs, but we could cram in about 8, 850 if we needed to. Um, so we feel like that's a good place to start and, uh, and plan for some growth there. Um, also, some kid space, about 9,500 square feet, which is way more than we have right now. Um, I don't know percentage-wise how, how much more, but it's three-quarters of the entire space that we rent here right now. So it's, it's quite a bit more. And it's obviously in proportion to number of seats in here. And then Pulse Ministry, we are planning uh, 6,100 square feet. The, uh, this room here, it's, that's about the size of this room for just Pulse. Um, and this back part is kind of like a multi-purpose 
half-court gym activity room, which you'll see a picture of kind of here in a minute. And then the beautiful, amazing, open, giant lobby space with tons of meeting space, cool little nook areas for people and groups to meet at. A couple of family group rooms where small groups can meet through the week, and then some office space. And that's kind of what we're planning. Um, the next, so total, it's we're looking right now at about 39,700 square feet. Um, and again, we rent about 12,000 in this building total. Um, so it would be over three times bigger than the space we rent here. Um, so that's awesome. Um, next slide is, this is a rendering of when you're parking in the parking lot and you're walking towards the main entrance. And you'll notice there's a lot of trees, and you're like, where's the building? Because we wanted it in a park-like setting, and we want it to be beautiful, right? And so uh, we love that it's kind of like you're walking in a park and you're coming upon the church building. Uh, next slide, please. This is the main entrance. So as you walk through those trees, this is kind of what it would look like. This is a big chimney for a fireplace. That's actually a whole room with a skylight and the chimney's in it. This is a beautiful porch and the fireplace is double-sided inside and outside. If you think of Cracker Barrel, the ginormous fireplace, kind of on both sides in there. Um, this is the main entrance. Those down the row there are kids' rooms and uh, all the way down, basically. And we told them we want them to look like a house. We want people to feel like they're coming home. We don't want it to look like you're walking up to a church or a mall or an industrial warehouse. We want people to feel like they're coming home to grandma's house. Your grandma just happens to be a really wealthy benefactor who has a nice giant house, all right? And so uh, next slide, please. This is you walk in those doors, and this is what you're looking at. Um, this is kind of the lobby and what it would look like. This is like the fireplace room, which is kind of a nice size room here on the left. And you'll notice a big cross beam, which you'll get a better look at here in a minute. And that's uh, steel, steel beams. <sighs> Explain that here in a minute. And uh, down through here, you'll see a lot of awesome meeting space down through the lobby. The far end has like a little kitchen that's like in the lobby. Uh, so it's kind of like, feels like a big dining room was kind of the concept there. And then our nice welcome center right here, which has our modified free people chain, broken chain link logo there. Uh, and then next slide, as you turn right to go down. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the next slide. So this is that fireplace room. And my first thought of that was, why did you put a giant cross beam right in the middle of the walkway? Like, that's, that's an obstruction. You know, I'm like thinking functionally, and I don't know about that. Well, our architects happen to be two spirit-filled Christian guys. And he gave us a prophetic word over why they designed this this way. And they're like, you see, this fireplace room, this is like the holy of holies. And the cross of Jesus, you walk under the cross. And the cross, see all that stonework? The cross is bearing our burdens. And we're free to enter in the holy of holies and be in the glory of God where the fire of God is, you know, in the throne room of God. And if you look up, it's an open skylight up above and the open heaven above your church and the Holy Spirit. And we were all just like, okay, leave it how it is. Like, so it was amazing. I'm getting goosebumps again. They even put some of our, these are actual paintings they pulled off, pictures of off of, uh, Facebook that some of our artists have done in services, and they threw those. We're like, okay, you're selling us. Um, so that was awesome. And you notice a lot of windows, a lot of light. So now if you come in that lobby and turn right, this is kind of what you would see. And on the left there are these kind of black box house-looking things. That's the entrances to our main room. Um, and it's, it's a sound barrier to have a kind of a double entrance there. Double door. So there's a set of doors and then another set of doors. Um, but it also frames in a spot in there that I'll show you in a minute. Um, again, just some uh, kid space and bathrooms, I think, there on the right. And the check-in for Wild and Free is that green wall down there. And the pulse space is at the very end of the hall there. Uh, so next slide, I think, is the kids' entrance. <laughs> Looks something like this. Wild and Free kids. Check in your kids. Go in there. And we don't have any other pictures or renderings of, like, what the kids' space might look like. Just really big, nice kids' rooms. Uh, way, way bigger than the ones we have right now because um, we cram a lot of kids in there uh, back there right now. So uh, next picture, this is like the Pulse activity room, kind of like a half-court gym, could do a lot of cool things in there and um, activities, games that they do a lot. Also use it as a bonus room for our kids' ministry on Sundays and whatnot. And then we, we don't have a rendering of the, the pulse room would probably look like this, right? Just a, a kind of black box room with a stage. Um, next slide, I think, is the main room. 
So this is a rendering, again, a bigger version of this. That's kind of what we're wanting. Potentially, potentially some wood beam accents with some cool tinkly lights, you know, uh, that look like stars. Uh, potentially. So uh, that's, that's pretty basic. And then uh, next slide there. So this is down that hallway looking back towards the main entrance or the, the fireside room there. And you'll notice between the two uh, main entrances, you have, they, they're like, this is your art gallery. I also teared up when they showed us this. Because um, we started displaying the prophetic art with a write-up uh, every Sunday out there. We felt led to do that. And I just love that they planned for that. And I, I think that's a, people can walk and see uh, more than just one piece of art. Of course, we'll probably have it all throughout the building. But I just thought that was really a really awesome touch that we hope to incorporate as well. And then next slide, please. Um, this is outside, kind of along that main front, just an example of, like, landscape fire pit areas, places for people to sit, hang out, and enjoy uh, each other and the Lord. Next slide, please. I th this is the front porch. So this is the other side of that uh, giant fireside room. Uh, and the main entrance is on up to the left there, uh, if you can envision that. To, to the right, this would, Lord willing, overlook the pond lake area. Um, as you can see, it would just be stunningly beautiful and an awesome place to hang out and do all kinds of stuff. Um, and then next slide, please. I th this is the last one. This is actually, if it's positioned the way we're planning and they planned it, <clears throat> you know, kind of looking along that whole side, and that's actually where the sun would set, and that's how it would actually look, you know, potentially at night, that type of thing. So I just thought that was really awesome. If you've ever been out to our land, it is really beautiful, <laughs> really beautiful, especially for Mount Oregon. Mount Orb's pretty flat, but our land has some rolling undulation to it. It's just a really, really beautiful place. So that, I think that's all the pictures. Um, that's what we're planning. That's what we're hoping for. Um, and we're excited about it. And we're inviting you into this with us. And where are we at in the process? What are our next steps? Uh, we're continuing to raise money. Uh, how much is this going to cost? We don't know yet, and uh, I'll get to that in a minute. I'll give you some projections from the architect and maybe a couple builders we're talking to. Um, so our building team, we're talking to Champlin about getting the construction set of drawings so that we can actually, we've talked to a few builders locally, and they're like, we really need to see a construction set before we can even give you a, a ballpark uh, estimate of what this would cost. Um, the architect said to me, or said to us in a one of the last meetings we had, uh, on most of their projects, now they do a lot of churches, but they do a lot of hospitals and business things. And they said, based on the, con the estimates of what we're seeing on average right now, um, cost per square foot is around, I think it was around 400 or a little over $400 a square foot. Now, <clears throat> in our research as we were beginning to plan this, that is astronomic. Like, that is over, over double what it was pre-COVID, right? So pre-COVID to build a church was like 150 to 200 a square foot. So they're saying 350 to four or more. So he went with the higher number, uh, maybe to scare us a little bit. Um, and he said, you know, that cost at this square footage, you'd be looking at around $16 million to build this building. And then they were like, how does that make you feel? And I'm just like, that's crazy. Like that is crazy. Uh, crazy expensive, and so we'll just see. Um, just crunching numbers um, with the what has been pledged, our giving potential, and all that. Uh, we could not afford that right now. Like that is probably over triple what we could afford right now. Um, and so that's interesting, right? And then we met with uh, we we're meeting with a few builders to just try to get some real numbers. Is that is that re reality? Could we do it cheaper? We've had this bent from the, be the beginning that, and some people already in our church have said, well, I will volunteer my services as a professional to do certain aspects, and uh, we felt from the beginning stuff like that was going to happen. We know other local churches where that's happening, and the cost per square foot is like astronomically lower than that because of that, um, and so um, we're, we're praying into this. We're praying into next steps. We're planning on getting a construction set of drawings so that we can get more accurate real numbers from local builders and start to engage some of our people who have said, 
uh, we could do this part or that part and say, okay, cool, if you did this, how much would that save us? So on and so on and so on. Um, we, did, we did meet with one builder who we said, just give us a super rough ballpark number, and it was about a third of that. So just, just to give it, so we're like, okay, whew, all right, that's feeling a lot better. Um, and again, these are, don't quote me on that, right? Things can change, but we're still in the discovery process. We know we need to keep uh, raising money, and so we want to keep inviting you into that. And you know what? If it gets to a place where it's like, it's just going to be really expensive, okay, we're going to keep praying, and we're going to keep raising money. That's, that's the plan, right? But we do feel led to keep going for this unless and until the Lord says no. Change the strategy. And I will say this about that. Well, let me just say this. When we started this process, there was, I don't have time to say all the things that happened spiritually that the Lord was confirming you know, go for this. Buying this building would have been so much easier, right? It would be way cheaper and and so much easier. But that's not what the Lord was was highlighting. And so we were feeling led very strongly, the whole team, everybody, like this, we're going for this, right? We're going to go this direction. This is going to require faith. Like the first weekend that the Lord was confirming that and speaking that, I think the fall of 2021, if my mind is right, um, the Lord, I was reading Hebrews 11. It's about faith. And, it, and I, that morning, literally, I was, my wife and I were drawing on napkins. Like, what if, what if we did this? Oh, what could we do with the building? Oh, that's so cool. We were kind of dreaming. And I read Hebrews 11 in my devotion that morning. And uh, I want to highlight a few verses from that. Verse 1 and verse 6. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Definition of faith, Hebrews 11.1. A few verses later, verse 6, it says, And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and. And I just feel led to preach this a little bit tonight. Very, I don't know if I've ever heard a sermon about the and. But there, it's not an or. It's not an either or. If you're going to have faith, God wants you to have faith not only that he exists, that, of course, that's step one. Believe God exists and that he is a God who rewards those who earnestly seek him. We believe in a God who is all good, who is all love. We not only believe he exists, he gave his only son to die for us on a cross to pay for our sins so we go to heaven. And as Romans chapter 8 says, if he gave his own son, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? God gave us the most precious thing. He loves us so much. He's a good God. And when God says in his word, he wants you to have faith in him. He wants you to trust him. Not only that he exists, which is where we stop most of the time. Believe God exists. Believe he gave Jesus for you. And then we stop. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now, we could probably talk all night about what are those rewards. How does God reward people? And man, that's a whole sermon series right there. A lot of those spiritual blessings that we talked about in communion or that we proclaimed and received over ourselves is how he rewards people. He rewards people through provision. He rewards people through healing and freedom and forgiveness and spiritual gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit and blessings of love and family and relationships, favor on your life. I could go on and on in the ways God rewards people. And there's many scriptures that talk about the reward is not only in heaven. I'm still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, scripture says. That godliness with contentment is great gain, but godliness has value in this life and in the life to come. Over and over and over again, scripture talks about God blessing us for this life and eternity. It's, it's a both and, it's not an either or. And so I just feel led to preach that to you and say, believe God for more in your life. Believe he's gooder than you think he is. Believe he's a gooder God. God is good. 
all the time, all the time, God is good, and he's gooder than what I believe he is. He's gooder and he's better. <laughs> believe it. Believe it. Believe it. So, brings me back to fall of 2021, talking about, the. I read this that morning, just thinking about this building stuff. It was feeling trepidatious to me. I was feel, really feeling like it'd be a lot easier to just buy this building. Although long term, it wouldn't be, there was a lot of practical reasons that's not good. It was built in the 70s, things are falling apart already, a lot of upkeep on it, and it's landlocked, and there's only couple acres and already if we have a full service right now it parking is we have to park down the street and all over and there's nowhere else to build around it's landlocked that's it so even the land you go one foot off this wall over here and it's owned by someone else it's not part of this building I know it's a nice big field over there it's not owned by same person so anyways there's a lot of practical reasons it wasn't a good idea but it would have been a lot easier (laughs) it would have been a simple quick fix And we just didn't feel led that way. And the way God was leading us required a whole lot more faith. And so anyways, I'm reading Hebrews 11.1. I read these two verses. Can you put them back up, please? And when I read them, after I read that second one, verse 6, the Holy Spirit stops me in my tracks. And he says, Aaron, do you believe that I reward those who earnestly seek me. Now imagine you just read that verse where it says it in black and white in his Bible, his word. And then the Holy Spirit asks you, do you believe this? Do you believe I reward those who earnestly seek me? Now you know that's a loaded question. (laughs) And I knew it was a loaded question. And I go, "Um, yes, Lord. (laughs) Yes, I believe that. Here it comes. What are you going to say next? And he says, good. Then I want you to have confidence about this building project, even when it looks like it's still not going, or even when it looks like it's not going to be possible. And I went from being super excited about what might happen with this building project to being like, oh, no. (laughs) Apparently, there's going to come a day when it looks like it might not be possible. (laughs) Oh, boy. Thanks for that encouragement, Lord. (laughs) I said, okay, Lord. Sounds good. And I'll just be honest, starting out, we were thinking pole barn building on a concrete pad cost a few million dollars. Totally possible. We can do this right now. Also, our giving potential was higher when we started out. Our ability to fundraise potential was higher. Our borrowing potential was higher when we started out. Everything looked really good. It looked really possible. And so so I thought, oh, boy. And then the architect's like, oh, $16 million. (laughs) Like, what are you talking about? And so I say all that to say I'm inviting you into a journey. I want to be very transparent about this journey and the cost of following the Lord. And what he's called us to do, especially in the last year. And he told us all in advance, this is going. He said to me at that conference, the day before he radically baptized me in the Holy Spirit, a guy was preaching about if if you choose the fullness of God and the Holy Spirit and going after God, the fullness of Scripture, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, he said it will cost you. It will cost you family. It will cost you friendships. It will cost you persecution. It will cost you this. It will cost you that. And he's going down this list. And he goes, you have to ask yourself, do you still want it? And I was, as he went down this list, I was going, check, check. I've already paid that cost. 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 And I was like kind of cynically, sarcastically laughing. Like, I've already paid the cost. Why not? <laughs> Why not get the fullness, <laughs> right? And I looked at my wife and I laughed and I go, Sure, why not? Like, do you still want it? I'm like, sure, why not? And I was laughing. And the Holy Spirit said, Aaron, this will cost you. And I was like, ooh. Our culture, American church especially, thinks that Jesus was just nice coddling, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest all the time. They think that's what came out of his mouth 24-7. They don't realize he looked at them and said, 
if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and die to yourself every day. You know, if anyone does not hate their own father and mother in relation to how they love me, Jesus is saying, you can't be my disciple. Why is that? Because there may be times when your own father and mother are like, don't do that. And the Lord, Jesus, is saying, do that. And you have to choose who your God is, who you fear more. And so the Lord said to me, it's going to cost you. And I said, all right, I'm all in. Let's do this. Whatever you want, God. And I fully surrendered him again the next morning. And I said, I'm all in, whatever you want. And he was speaking to me that morning. He said, I want you to start doing words of knowledge in your services. I want you to do a first Friday Holy Spirit prayer night. I'm like, okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. Whatever else you want, you just say it. We'll do it. And then that afternoon, they did a prayer impartation service, and I got prayed over, and I got radically baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he set us on a course of just, a, cor- a course we were already on, a trajectory we were already on, but going, bringing it to the fullness of the culture that he wanted in our church, and honestly, in his church, period. And it's been an amazing journey. Charles Dickens comes to mind. It was the best of times. It was really hard. <laughs> oh, those of us who know think it's funny. But, I mean, the fruit we've seen of the Holy Spirit has been radical and amazing. I mean, great. We've seen the biggest, best fruit we've ever seen in our lives. The, we've seen the glory of God. We've, whew, people not only being filled with the Holy Spirit, as I've said, our, our revival last year, which was on that trajectory after all that, right? The Lord let us do that. Whew. I mean, w- within three weeks, we see almost 70 people get baptized, saved in Christ. You know, people, some of the critics might think, oh, they're just a charismatic church now. They just care about getting filled with the Holy Spirit. No, we care about all of it. We care about all of it. Get saved, get baptized, get filled with the Holy Spirit, and go out and change the world. That's what it's about. It's all of it. It's not one or the other. But we don't stop like most churches at part of the way and say, get saved. Good. Now you're going to heaven. Now sit in your seat and just hear me teach sermons the rest of your life. No. And if you're going to go out and change the world, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to drive out demons, which our church does and is going to continue to do in greater ways, you need the filling of the Holy Spirit. You need the gifts, power, courage of the Holy Spirit. So anyways, don't get me started. Y'all are getting me started. You're, You're begging me to preach that to you. Stop it. I can feel you getting fired up. It's firing me up. So just simmer down. This is an annual church business meeting. <laughs> huh. What was I talking about? The cost. So it has been incredible. We had more baptisms last year in a calendar year, almost double any other year we've ever had. And we've had many this year already. Many. I don't know how many. I didn't look it up yet. But there has been a cost. And the Lord has told us all along, it's going to cost you. And he started warning us, prophetic warnings, uh, throughout yeah, last year. There's a sifting. People are going to leave. Giving's going to go down. He's just warning us. Read, the chap- read Acts chapters 21 through 27-ish. The Apostle Paul, bound by the Spirit, I have to go to Jerusalem. I have to. Yet, The Holy Spirit keeps warning me, nothing but prison and hardships are awaiting me. Why would, and then it says that a lot of the other believers are warning him through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. Hold up here, what's happening? All the other believers were getting prophetic warnings and telling Paul, you go to Jerusalem, you're getting arrested. And then in their humanity, their interpretation of that prophecy was wrong, which was don't go because they're like, we don't want you to go to prison, so don't go. That's not what the Holy Spirit was saying. The Holy Spirit was saying to Paul, you must go to Jerusalem. But you're going to be arrested. And many other hardships are coming your way because you're doing my will. And what I've learned is the Lord will prophetically warn you at times about what's coming because you're doing his will. And here's why. So that when you get into it and the hard things come, I don't know about you, but when, whenever something bad or hard happens, our natural inclination is to go, oh, maybe this wasn't God. Or maybe I messed up. Or maybe I wasn't supposed to do this because now I have some enemies and now I have some people who don't like me. 
And you know, before this, before this last year, and really before 2020, I didn't have too many people calling me a heretic. I didn't have too many people calling our church a cult, right? You know what I'm saying? Maybe you don't, but I do. And so now, <laughs> this is a different story. <laughs> and if you didn't have those prophetic warnings, if the Holy Spirit himself had not told you, hey, guess what? This is coming. This is coming. I'm warning you and I'm telling you so that when it happens, you do not lose heart. Jesus said that to the disciples. I've told you in advance so when it happens, you don't lose heart. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. I've told you in advance so when it happens, you don't lose heart. So that you don't lose heart. So that when it happens, you do not misinterpret the hardship and go, I must not be doing God's will, but rather you interpret correctly and go, I'm doing exactly what he wants. And so the Lord's been warning. He warned us last year very early on. It's going to cost you. People are going to leave. Money's going to get tight, tighter. And that started to happen right after the awesomest thing ever, which was our revival. And we get back from revival. We're like, we're going after God. Revival every week. Ah! And a new wave of people started to leave our church. And giving significantly started to go down. And so that has continued. And... Even recently in the last month, moving to our new wineskin strategy, the Holy Spirit was warning. And I told our team, staff, leadership, I said, listen, there's some people who left our church post-COVID because they just, you know, disagreements or whatever, just felt led to leave, whatever the things were. And it was more naturalistic types things. And it's just time to leave, that type of stuff. There's some people who left our church in the past year because of, like, Holy Spirit makes them uncomfortable. They don't know what to do with it, and they're not ready for that yet. And, and you know, and they decide to leave. This isn't for me or whatever. I said, there will be some people who've stuck with us that whole journey who they're like, I just can't do between two and three hour church services. And I just don't like the Saturday, Sunday thing. And it's just a logistical thing. They just don't like it. And they're, and they're going to leave. And it's okay. And we bless those people. It's part of the cost. And the Lord doesn't allow that or cause that to just make you suffer for Jesus. There's a purpose in it. And the purpose in the sifting is that, it, the, the, by the way, the early church disciples went through this. Thousands of followers, and go read John chapter 6, went from thousands. He called them disciples, the 5,000 he led. Many disciples stopped following him, John chapter 6, after the hard time of hard teaching. And so, right as we're starting our new strategy, we're like, hey, let's preach on spiritual warfare and deliverance for like the next three or four months. Yay. <laughs> let's talk about the devil every week. Yay. <laughs> How to get rid of him. And some people are like, this is too much for me. <laughs> I don't know what to do during prophetic worship and I'm uncomfortable because I don't know how to worship the Lord myself yet. And instead of learn and press into that discomfort because your discomfort zone is called the faith zone. And instead of learn and grow and, oh, spiritual warfare and deliverance makes me uncomfortable because the devil makes me uncomfortable and fearful. And instead of press in by faith and learn and grow, some people have chosen to say, this isn't for me now. And they've moved on, and that's okay. And the purpose in the sifting is this. The early church went through this. They went from thousands of disciples and followers down to 120 in the upper room. Why would Jesus do that? Why would God allow that? The sifting is to get you down to the core of people who are all in no matter what. And there's a purpose in that. When Pentecost came, Peter preaches one sermon, instant mega church, 3,000 people now. And these are like solid believers who are not falling away. And then he preached, heals a guy and preaches another sermon, and then there's 2,000 more, and now it's 5,000 people. And most likely they're just counting them in. We're talking probably 10,000 people within the first year of the early church. Boom, explosive growth. Way more probably than the thousands that were following before. So what was the sifting for? You get down to this core who are all in because in discipleship, you reproduce what you are. And if you have people who are compromised and complacent and they're afraid and they want to buy in more to idolatry of the world or the fear of the world or the fear of man, and if that's what you're full of as you grow your church and then you disciple those new believers, the, the new believers are discipled in the culture of the current church. And so as the Lord is like, you're going to go through this sifting. You're going to get down to a preserved core. I don't know how low it's going to go, church. I don't know. <laughs> I'm 
that's the challenging part. That's where faith comes in. Okay, Lord. Another word that's been consistent throughout the last year, a word of warning, but a word of wisdom. Gideon's army, the sifting, you get down to that preserved core. We're all in. We're with you, Gideon, no matter what. First sifting, whoever's fearful, you're welcome to leave. 10,000 people leave. Then God's like, still have too many. Then 22,000 more leave. Gets them down to 300 people versus hundreds of thousands. And we go, what are you doing, God? And God's like, I like these odds. This takes faith. Now you're going to have to really depend on me. And that's what he told Gideon. That's why. That's why. Now you have to depend on me. You know, it's Independence Weekend. God wants us to be free people who are dependent people on him. (laughs) And so he's sifting. He's getting us down to this preserved core. Who People who are like, I'm all in. I want the fullness of God. Holy Spirit, let's do it. Weird stuff. If it's God's stuff, then I'm in. Let's go. Driving out the devil sounds good to me. I like that. All of it. I want all of it. That's what he's getting us to. And then when the outpouring comes and the outpouring draws crowds and people by the hundreds and by the thousands and those people get saved and come into the culture of the church and they get discipled they don't get discipled in complacency and idolatry of american culture and what golden calf christianity and what you know we're in a culture in a season and a time in america when 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 the church thinks god is the clay and we want to mold and make god what we want him to be he's the potter we're the clay And so he gets to that people, and then when he pours out, and when he draws, and when he adds to their number daily, those who are being saved, they're discipled in that culture. The fullness of God. That's what he's doing. And I believe that's what he wants in every church. But I'm not responsible for every church. Praise the Lord Jesus. (laughs) But as for me and my house, this is what we're doing. And I've said many times to my wife and our staff and our leadership, especially in the fearful times. We will ride this out. We will not stop. We will not turn back. And if you start looking at number of people or giving numbers, those are really bad reasons to make spiritual decisions. Really bad. The early church never did that. It's what do you want, God? Holy Spirit, show us. And we're doing what you want. And God, God's, I will build my church, Jesus said. It's his responsibility to add to the number. Our responsibility is faithfulness. And that's what we're going after. So I want to give you some practical, real numbers of where we're at, because I don't want to scare you. We are being sifted. Our, our attendance is lower than it was. I, I, we're probably high 400s. Do you know, Matt? That's right, Five, high 400s. You know, post-COVID, we were averaging, say, 550, you know, to give you a ballpark. Before our revival, we were back up into the six and 700s. Then we do a revival, awesomest stuff ever, and then we go down. So anyways, <laughs> so that's about where we're at attendance-wise. And giving has gone down significantly, percentage-wise. Um, so our giving has always been up and to the right as a church family even through COVID, up and to the right and stable and all that. And then after revival, it started going down because some f- families were leaving that were givers and whatnot. Um, and uh, our, our average, you kind of do three-month rolling averages for churches because it's all donation-based. And our average giving right now is about $51,000 a month, okay? Pre-revival, it was like sick high mid to high 60s, so 65 and upwards. Our budget last year, monthly budget, was $65,000, and we met that or exceeded that every month. It was totally fine, right? Uh, By the way, we budget everything. We still do this off of 80% giving. We give away 10%, and we save 10%, and we've always done that, and we are always going to try to do that, but that 10% saving is kind of that buffer, you know? Um, And then if things got super tight, maybe we can't give, but I don't think the Lord will ever allow that. Um, but anyways, so we set our budget this year at 59000 a month. We made some cuts. We made some changes. Um, a lot of it was insurance changes where we saved thousands of dollars a month. Praise the Lord Jesus. Uh, good changes, too. Um, 
that I think will e be even better. Um, so 59000 though, includes that 10% savings. So to, to pay all the bills and staff and do all the things that we budgeted and give away 10%, we're looking at around 55000 And so a current average giving is about 51000 Now, praise the Lord Jesus, we have a lot in savings. We have a good savings account. Uh, I think there's a little over $400,000 in our savings right now. Um, and so that's awesome. Um, when you're in a multi-million dollar building project, that's not a lot of money, right? But um, that's kind of what we call that emergency fund, as we've kind of followed Dave Ramsey principles on a church-wide scale because it's wisdom. And, um, and so if things get tighter, we have that savings and we can live off, you know, make up that difference for quite a while. Um, so praise God for that. Um, and then in our current building, I think already, our, our current building fund, do you know the number? Is it, is it that, it's not the year, year to date number. Yeah, a few hundred thousand. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I, don't, I didn't have that number. We have a few hundred thousand dollars. We put a down payment down, and then we've, we're paying on the, the land and whatnot. So we still have a few hundred thousand in our, um, in our building fund, too. So that's awesome. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, and in light of that, like that's what I was referencing when I'm saying our borrowing potential, if we were to take out a loan for the building, is, is, is less than it was uh, last year. Um, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to explain on that. So, uh, you know, we're not hurting as a church. And by the way, our staff and leadership, we're not worried either. Um, part of that is the wisdom of our leadership in the past, and we have savings, right? That's why Dave Ramsey is like, get an emergency fund so when crap hits the fan, you're not freaking out. You're like, oh, it's all right. We've prepared for this. This is all right. Um, so praise God for wisdom and good leaders and the teams that we had up here earlier who helped make all those decisions. Um, but that's where we're at. Now, obviously in light of where we're at uh, and what we're going after with the building, that's even more challenging, right? And here's another commitment I want to let you know. I've told our team we will not lose our heart of generosity while we're trying to build a building. So in a season where we need a lot of money, to do something we want to do, we're not going to not be generous. And so we felt led even a few months ago, I was like, I feel like we should like give money to other churches or ministries that have really blessed us who are doing building projects. And, and so we've given, I think, $1,000 a piece to, to five different ministries recently to bless their building funds and their building projects. Um, and of course, always giving away 10% regularly, that sort of thing. We want to maintain that heart of generosity. And that's us saying we will not fear and we're going to have faith. Um, but we also want to have wisdom. We're also not charging forward going, I mean, if the Lord gave a prophetic word, he's given us millions of dollars tomorrow and we're doing this, then we would proclaim that, I guess. But um, <laughs> he hasn't. So we're just moving with wisdom. Um, he hasn't yet. Okay. Um, and <laughs> just make sure. Um, although my wife and I did have a prophetic word, he said, pre uh, this guy said, prepare for a $20 million vision. And this was last year. I was like, well, I already know what that is. It's the fullness of that plan, the fullness with all the stuff. Yeah, that, okay, sure. Um, check, prepared. Now what? <laughs> uh, send the rain, Lord. Um, so I just want to invite you in to pray with this for us. I want you to know that we have good leadership. We make wise decisions. We're not going to rush forward with anything unwise financially. We're not going to charge into a building project we can't pay for. That's why. But if we don't even have enough faith to continue the process, then it's not going to happen, right? So if the Lord can provide in two ways, he can give us millions of dollars to build this building, or he can make things cost astronomically cheaper than they should. And it's a fish and loaves situation. We have very little, and yet somehow it provides for the whole thing, right? He can do it one of those two ways. He can also do it however he wants. Um, but to keep... To say we're going to keep praying, we're going to keep moving forward, that's the invitation for him to move and for him to keep doing things. And so we want to invite you to pray with us into all this. Keep praying. Um, but this is where we're at in the process. If Free People Church is your home and you're not involved yet, now's the time to get involved. And get involved giving, get involved serving, get involved praying, um, just becoming a part of our church. And if you want to give to the building campaign, 
uh, you can give online. Uh, and it's a drop-down menu. You just When you give, there's a menu that says general fund or building fund, right? And click the building fund to give to that. General fund goes to everything else. I will say if you're going to give, um, I would encourage you highly. to Giving to the building fund is over and above normal tithes and offerings. So if we all are like, I'm just going to tithe to the building, then we're raising money for a building, and all of a sudden we have to lay off all of our staff, and then ministry stops because we're not just paying the normal bills, right? So we give normal tithes and offerings, and that's biblical, by the way, and I don't have time to explain all that, but go back and watch that sermon series uh, for the homecoming campaign last year, and I walked through all that for five weeks. Um, so normal tithes and offerings, monthly giving, whatever, and then um, giving over and above to the building campaign, and I would invite you into that and, and uh, pray, prayerfully consider how you might want to continue giving into this, um, and so that's where we're at, and that's what we're going after, and uh, we're just continuing the process. And in the meantime, I want to say this. This building is beautiful. We feel led by the Lord to continue pursuing it, um, but it is not an idol, and there's a, <laughs> I just don't think about it most days because my concern is our church and the culture of our church and the people of our church and the people we're trying to reach. In the end, all that matters is God and people in eternity. So money and buildings, they're just tools. And man, say tomorrow somebody donates the money and this thing's built in a year. Great. We have this beautiful church home. What are we filling it with? That's what matters. That is what matters, right? And that will always be our heart. That The things of God will always take precedence. And so if for some reason this never happens, that's okay. We're doing ministry. We're going after God. He's going to provide. We don't, quote, unquote, need a building. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. But we do feel led, just like in your home, in your family. Do you need a house? Well, technically, we could live in a tent, right? Okay, is what you fill your house with more important than the house itself? Absolutely, the culture of your home, the love in your home, absolutely, that's the most important thing. But do you think long-term and wisely, you know what, we've been renting for five years, we're just throwing this money away. It would be better to buy a house and the mortgage is probably gonna be less than our rent and now we're building equity and now this is just smarter, right? We've been renting this building since 2015. To renovate this room and all that, that was $300,000 about, we and then the rent money on top, right? We we've poured a ton of money into something that's temporary, and so um, that's the wisdom of this type of thing. So, but as I said, the spiritual is always press, takes precedent. That's our focus, um, and so continue joining us in this. That's the update. If you have more questions, we're very transparent financially. Uh, if you have questions about our budget and how we do all that and what we give towards or what we plan for. More specifically, email us, and we will absolutely fill you in on that. No no problem, more specifically. Um, and I just want to say, lastly, thank you to all of you who give and serve here. It, it's what makes this all possible and makes it all happen. So God bless you, and thank you for that. And, uh, and we're looking forward to, to what God's going to do. And we're moving forward confidently in faith, knowing that we have a good Father who rewards those who earnestly seek him. Amen? Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for our time together tonight. And I thank you for everything you've done here tonight. I thank you for these new elders, uh, Kenton and um, Dallas. And uh, I thank you for the core team that is transitioning, that's handing the baton to this new eldership. And we thank you for the dreams you're filling us with, the dreams and visions. Thank you for this new church home that you've been planning for us, that you had us start in a time and place where you filled us with faith for it and you set us on the course. And I just pray that you would give us faith to finish it and I just ask your provision over it. If it's your vision, you will make it happen and we thank you for that. And uh, we trust you and your leadership. And we just pray that you would fill your people with your glory, pour out your spirit in this place, in this time, in this season. And help us be faithful to steward it well 
And I just thank you for this building that you're going to provide one day. I pray it is never becomes an idol, but it just always fills us with more gratitude because of the story and the way you provide it. And we're always thankful for it, but we never idolize it. And we praise you for that as well. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.